Dr. Pat, now we start the serious yes. conversation. No, it's the official. <laughs> we are here, uh, Dr. Pat. I'm really happy that you took the time. Um, I respect all of your work. I respect the consistency. I often talk about, you know, with me that I always want to never let anybody out consistent me, right? Mm. And I feel like that's how you are to a T. Yeah, I, I mean, it's... Uh... I, I'm just a big believer in like habits, you know, like, like putting good systems in your life, having really good habits and just like, because if you're just trying to will yourself through life, you're, you're, you know, it's that, that's going to run out pretty quick. But like, you know, for me, it's like I've been doing what I do for so long that it's just like almost automatic at this point in time. Like, uh, training, reading, working, writing, that sort of a thing. Like people are always like, oh, you must be so busy. I don't even feel busy, but a lot still gets done because it's almost on autopilot. Yeah. It has been for so long. But um, yeah, I think that for the most part, like we, we run on habits as, as you know, and you either have good habits or bad habits. It's like your brain doesn't even care at a certain point, you know, but mm-hmm. if you care about like your outcomes in life, you might as well make them good. Yeah. You know, because eventually it doesn't matter. It, like you don't notice them. So if you have more good habits, you're probably going to go further in life, not even know why. It's like you're getting dragged along by a positive riptide instead of like getting drowned by a really negative one. Did you always have those great habits no, since no, you were a kid? Not at all, man. I'm like, you know, I've had substance abuse problems. Oh, wow. You know, a lot of uh behavioral issues as a kid like those kinds of things so too, yeah you know i yeah. really had to sort of like write my ship yeah it's crazy i mean you had you say you have behavioral issues um how did pat when did pat want to become dr pat and what was your motivation to becoming dr pat and yeah. going through the channels of academia and becoming mm-hmm. and getting your phd inevitably yeah i mean i always i always love sports you know for me sports were like the great equalizer of life like it didn't matter if you were a rich kid or if you had you know all the good stuff that i wanted that i didn't have like when we're between these lines none of that matters and i can flatten you you know mm-hmm. and it, or you can flatten me like it's it's actually equal like so i always like stopwatches and weights on bars and like you know distances and rules and structure and that kind of stuff because it just felt like the only inherently fair part of life you know so i always found like my safe place my happy place in sports and training and uh you know it just was a shut off my mind too and so you know, I think that outside of that, life didn't make a lot of sense to me. It never did. Other people didn't make that much sense to me. Um, <laughs> and like, I just went on some ugly sidetracks to like escapism, avoidance of reality, that sort of a thing. And, um, you know, but I think that I always had the pull back to training and sports and stuff like that. And I was always pretty smart. You know, I mean, there's just like, you, you kind of either have it or you don't like uh it's almost like it is kind of like sports you know what i yeah. mean like at a certain point it's like it, the cream sort of rises to the top if you just let it and um yeah i mean like i i, th- I always feel like i was fortunate to be like a bad drunk you know like just you know no chance never once like touching a substance and not going into like full blackout mode full completely off the rails so it just was like so negative and so punishing and so non You hit rock bottom quick. Very quick. Yeah. Very, very quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Got it out the way. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, 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 and it yeah. was like, all right, well, if I don't have that stuff, I always felt feel like there's a to-do list in life and a to-not-do list. And, like, for me, like, just having a few really important things in the to-not-do list, it just allowed me to kind of, you know, I, I think that for me, if I take my – insane focus and i put it into the wrong things it's just a total disaster black hole nightmare if i just channel them in some right direction it's almost like i'm gonna become obsessed with something and just go all in on it so it's kind of a a double-edged sword it's a really good sort of a mind state for academia or being obsessed with something and goal-oriented pursuits but if you go down the wrong track, you know, I was going to either be in a grave or prison or a mental hospital. So it's like. Well, things know, turned out well. They, uh, yeah. <laughs> You're here on combo score. So right. You're doing yeah, exactly. something right. <laughs> but I always, I, you know, I just like to be real about that stuff because 
you know, they're probably, I always think like there's always other people like you out in the world, you know, and I wouldn't have had any hope at like 20 years old. You know, right. I wouldn't have thought like I could have a pretty productive, decent life. So for other people that might, you know, sort of have a similar thing, it's kind of like, you know, there's, there's always opportunities. There's always chances in life. So you do a great job of keeping an elevated perspective, not falling for the fitness trends. Is that because of your background in academia or is that more of practicing what you preach with your time in the weight room and working out? I, I would say it's probably more due to actual training and competing in sports really? than the other. You know, I really? remember, yeah, like I, I was, a, I worked as a professor and at the same time I was competing in strongman. And I remember going to compete in, and so I've got all this like academic stuff that I can put into designing my training programs and like, you know, being a scientific and cutting. It's almost like, you know, uh, Rocky Four. Like I've got okay. the, <laughs> the Ivan Drago gym sort of a thing going. Right. On. And then showing up to compete against guys and losing to dudes that are like, you know, coal miners. Right. Uh, or, you know, they're still drunk from the night before or something like that. Exactly. And it's kind of like, and then you talk to them like, hey, how do you train? And they just say something that's so outlandish where it's like, that doesn't make any sense at all. But this guy still just absolutely handed it to me. So it's like, it's, it's a great uh, slice of humble pie. And I think that like you have to keep getting that slice of humble pie fed to you over and over again, or you start to believe in your own Kool-Aid, you know? Yeah. Which I think is never a good place to be. Like you, you got to just the putting your ass on the line and testing yourself against other people who are probably coming at it from completely different perspectives has always just shown me that there's a lot of different ways to skin the cat. There's probably a few common denominators, like being mentally tough, being consistent, super consistent. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and also just sort of there's like just a personality type or something where it's like this person's gonna win. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like this this is the person that was going to win. They are going to win. They were always going to win. Like I, I think of it as like the you know the Michael Jordan kind of a thing. Like that mm -hmm. guy's mind was already made up. He's going to win. Right. Did that drive? The athleticism, what was it? What was the chicken or the egg there? But like you know, at a certain a elite combination of both, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, how do you cipher through what's a breakthrough in your industry and what's a trend? Well, I think the research is ultimately kind of where the rubber meets the road, you know, okay. and not just like one study, but a group of studies that are all pointing in the same direction. Like mm. I always think, like one data point is nice but a convergence of information all sort of shoving itself towards something is really meaningful yeah yeah i always think about this like when we look back 200 years ago in any industry or how we acted it looks crazy right so 200 years from today what will we be looking back on today that that looks crazy i used to have a powerpoint slide first day of class <laughs> and it was the uh picture of those fat shaking belts from black and white oh times, my you know God, what I'm saying? Yeah. And um, I'm always like, hey, what do you think about this picture? You know, yeah. oh, it's ridiculous, it's stupid. I'm like, I wonder what the picture is of today that 50 years from now- What do you think that is? Gonna, some some guy's gonna put this up on a PowerPoint and say, what do you think about this? And yeah. I'm gonna laugh. Yeah. And, and I don't know, it's like you're always blind to what you're immersed in. Yeah, you know? what, what's one current fitness trend that has to go? Oh man, um, you know I think that that's a that's a can of worms question right there because I think it depends on who you're working with. Okay, mm -hmm. like it, it's it's always to me it's just like the goal is very specific to the person. Okay, know? and that is a dramatically. Do I want to train the person that's going to compete in uh, half pipe skateboarding the same way that I want to train the guy that's going to be a nose tackle in the NFL? No. Like, they're such complete opposite human beings. Right. And if they were to try to switch places and do the other person's sport, both of them are probably going to die. So they actually need some. I might die if I'm doing what you're doing on the day to day, right? And, and if I try to go out and play basketball against the dudes you probably uh, yeah. play with, I'm going to want to die because it's going to be like the most embarrassing thing in the world. So, you know, I just think that it's like, uh, I don't know. It's just, there's not a lot of common sense matched with like, 
uh, understanding right tool, right job, right time sort of a thought process. Mm. Um, you know, it's like people get like different people that work in fitness, they, they sort of become the thing that they do. You know, it's almost like, oh, I'm the a kettle- caricature of themselves. Yeah. Like yeah. I'm the kettlebell guy. And like now everybody I work with swings kettlebells or like <laughs> right. I'm a bodybuilder. I'm a power lifter. I'm a this. I'm a that. And like they train everyone the same as they train themselves. And it's like. Man, this is such a different strokes for different folks sort of a deal. Yeah. Different kinds of athletes and different needs and like, what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? It's, I have to create a composite of who the person is and what they need, understand the gaps in what they currently have and where we need to push them. And if I don't have that sort of a thought process being super open minded, man, I'm pretty useless in all, in all honesty. Yeah. It's it's really funny, Dr. Pat, because I am actually the kettlebell guy and <laughs> I am him. Like, so when I talk to smart people who know what they're talking about, they tell me it's just a tool, right? That's it. It is just a tool. But I would say, right? So during the pandemic, I stopped lifting conventional weights. Mm-hmm. I only used kettlebells and body weight stuff. And my bench press did go up when I came back to a bench press. Mm-hmm. Some people would call it the what the hell effect. How do you explain that, Dr. Pat? Um, I mean, did you gain weight? I don't think so. Okay. Yeah, I don't think so. Because a lot of times weight and bench press kind of go together. Okay. I, I've, I've seen that a lot. Okay. Um, you know, it might have just been that you found something that you like to train that was strength oriented. Yeah, that's so probably you it. did more of it. Yeah. And put on some muscle tissue and muscle tissue is pretty useful mm-hmm. for bench press. So there's always like, you know, kind of one, one smoking gun thing. If you do your detective work, there's like a guy standing there with, with a bloody hand. You're like, I think that guy did it. Yeah. And, and usually if you're bench pressing more or squatting more, you, you probably added some muscle tissue in the right place. And if you train more with weights, you're going to add some muscle tissue. So. You know, it is interesting because I always worked out a lot, but during that time when we had more time, I just worked out more when a lot of people were working out less. So that could have been part of it, you know? I think there, there, there you go. Like, now, we now, figured it out on now combo score. starting to get pretty clear here. Yeah. Uh, what's the biggest misconception when it comes to building muscle? I don't think people understand how important food is for it eventually. Wow. You yeah. know, because you are trying to add tissue. Okay. And if you're trying to add tissue, you have to be in a calorie surplus. Mm. Okay. And because if you're, you know, if you're in a calorie deficit, you're going to lose tissue. Okay. If you're in maintenance calories, you're staying the same with tissue. So you have to eat more calories than you're spending to be able to grow something and build something. So, you know, if you're, eating enough food, the training all of a sudden becomes productive. And Technically, yes, you could gain some muscle tissue if you're in a calorie deficit. You could gain some muscle tissue and you're in a- Especially if you're a beginner and you start lifting. A hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, I almost think of it as like levers that you can pull, okay? Right. Like if you've never lifted weights before, you've got this fresh lever that's like training. You pull that thing and it's unbelievably powerful. You're super sensitive to it. If you've pulled it and it's been on for a while, the sensitivity of it kind of drops off. You know, yeah. it doesn't drive uh, the train as hard as it once did. Uh, now it's kind of like the other lever you have is is nutrition and sort of the other one you might have is sleep. Yeah. In all honesty, um, sleep and like lifestyle stress management. But um, if 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 you've trained for any length of time, you know, now it's like if you want to change the outcomes, you got to pull that nutrition lever. So what are you eating differently since now you're a competitive bodybuilder and that means yeah. so much? So I basically go through a phase of either gaining or losing. Right. You know, right. that's basically it. And right now I'm in the phase of, of losing fat. Okay. So I've just started week five of fat loss dieting. What uh, does that look like? Um, well, it, it looks like... Is it still a lot of food at the end of the day because you have to keep your muscle? Compared to what normal people eat, yeah, probably. <laughs> right. But for me, I'm pretty hungry, you know? Right, like, yeah. And I'll just get hungrier and hungrier and hungrier until like week 18 where it's like, you know, it gets really dicey in a lot of ways. But, you know, I, I uh, competed in bodybuilding last December 16th. Like stepped on stage, I was 195 pounds. 
by the start of June, I was 249 pounds. Wow. Uh, right now, I'm 231 pounds. Okay. So it's aggressive. Yeah. You know, it's a it's aggressive approach. Yeah. You know, and uh, like uh, by the end of Ju- by the beginning of June, I was eating about seven thousand calories a day. Okay. And you know, I, I measure it more in the way of like grams of protein, carbs, and fat. So it's always I have to reverse engineer to tell you how many calories it is. I was at a thousand grams of carbs a day, which makes if you don't if you've never eaten that way that's a meaningless number if you've eaten that way you're like oh my god that's that's insane you know what i mean that's like uh dunking on a 13 foot hoop or something like that you know (laughs) yeah but it's um you know it what that allowed me to do because i basically stopped gaining weight even though i was eating about seven thousand calories a day a thousand grams of carbs what were you what are you eating though like at that point i was eating cinnamon toast crunch four times a day and um, I'd eat one meal of real food. And when was this exactly? The beginning of June was the end of gaining. So wait, so when you're gaining for competitive reasons, you could really eat whatever you want. Like you could just whole, eat a whole bunch of cereal. It still has to fit inside of a a macro. That sounds fun, actually. Macro That sounds really fun. Scheme. I'm not gonna it's, lie. It's not fun. It's <laughs> but the, but they're just eating cinnamon toast crunch because you feel like it. You, that part you sounds fun. Think that. <laughs> but you know, it was. 150 grams of cinnamon toast crunch with 450 grams of 2% milk four times a day with protein powder. And then, um, you know, for what I would try to keep real food in my life to some degree, but it turned into like one meal a day. And that meal was like 400 grams of rice and, uh, 200 grams of chicken. And, uh, and, you know, then, intra workout shake and stuff like that it's so much food that like you're I, like i wasn't hungry for weeks and weeks and weeks but still eating you know it's like a yeah. different it's a different thing and you know eventually pushing myself to the point of like pretty much being diabetic and uh unhealthy like oh wow well, yeah, that's what i wanted to ask you yeah, yeah because, so, like like what somebody does to make them look good on the outside might not be what's best for them in the inside right yeah, I mean, there was nothing, there's nothing healthy about that rate <laughs> right. of weight gain. It's, there's nothing healthy about playing baseball and throwing a ball 102 miles an hour. True. 40 times a game or something like that. There's, uh, high level sports and com- training and comp, there's, it's not a healthy thing. There's nothing healthy about playing in the NFL. You know, uh, yeah. playing basketball isn't inherently healthy. I wouldn't you know? say so for not the joints. The way, yeah, not yeah. the way, you know, professional yeah. basketball players play and have to hammer their bodies and fly, you know, all over the place and change 10 time zones a week or something like that. It's, you know, it's it's hard. There's a reason that very few people can do it. Yeah. Um, so it's, but yeah, in terms of tissue change, I mean, it comes down to like, yeah, I mean, you got to, you got to push food. Like to me, food is another form of training. I have to train myself to be able to eat that much food. You yeah. can't just you can't just take a regular person on day one, have them eat that way for six straight weeks. They're 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 they won't do it. It's yeah. so uncomfortable in so many ways. I if you think about it, I gained fifty four pounds in five and a half months i think that's crazy that is like 1.7 pregnancies in two-thirds of unbelievable the time. yeah you know think about how uncomfortable women are as they go through pregnancy they're very uncomfortable you know they don't, some some of them don't even want to do it again once they do it once <laughs> Swe- swelling yeah um you know i like the fatigue of it i would i was right. going to, i have a four-year-old i was just sleeping on his schedule and oh yeah four-year-old okay I, have a five-year-old. I was thinking that's about cool. it like yeah. Basically, I was growing at the same rate as a toddler. Right. I needed to sleep at the same rate as a toddler. Yeah. It's costly to grow that much. Yeah. You know? what, do you, what are your thoughts on the carnivore diet? Not to get into trends, because I yeah. feel like like that's one of those diets for me, and this is all bro science, like I've done no research, yeah. that it probably could make most people look better, but it might not be best for your insides. Even if it, like, all that aside, for an athlete, it's not optimal by any means Mm -hmm. it you know what it comes down to is like there's there's like a spectrum of of diet from like terrible all the way up to like optimal perfect and the average american diet is so bad that any of these other ones exactly are better right right vegan is not great 
you know, but it's much better than average American. So it, you get good results in the beginning. You know, people yeah. are like, oh, my God, my skin is glowing. I've lost weight. I feel amazing. Yeah, because it's better than a, you know, on a scale of 100, a 1. And, like, all the way at the end, at like, 100 is basically, like, scientific eating where you measure it and you have, like, uh, the numbers of fat grams, protein grams, carb grams that you're supposed to hit for a goal and you're, you know, measuring all your performance metrics and your body composition metrics and you do it in phases of times where you're trying to grow, times where you're staying the same, times where you're losing. Like, that's, that's the, you know, the ultimate version of that. Carnivore is like another one of these ones that's restrictive and uh, Very, you're probably right? going to lose weight on it ultimately. Yeah. But it's because you're cutting out so much stuff, you know? You probably will get a more vascular look, right? If you go that direction. It, you're going to like indirectly bump into weight loss and fat loss. Right, right. Just simply because you don't have a lot of choices and, um, you know, protein is more satiating than other forms of food. So, like all of the reasons that people give for like why intermittent fasting works or vegetarian diets work or carnivore diets work or paleo, whatever, it's it always comes down to calories. And typically people lose weight, like the way they look, feel a little bit better and give some magical credit to a diet that just reduced calories through restriction means. Yeah. Why did you take the route of aesthetics over the route of straight strength when it comes to your own personal journey? I'm old at this point. And <laughs> I've competed in the strength sports. Okay. And it's just kind of tough on the joints eventually. Really? Okay. Yeah. And, um, you know, I mean, I've done speed sports, power sports, strength sports. I've done a full gamut of, of these things. And, like, you know, I'm not as fast as I used to be. I'm not as flexible You're as still I fast. I see the videos, man. So I'll, I'll surprise people. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, even I'm telling you, if I can get lose a little bit of weight, if I play basketball, people are like, wait, what? Yeah, like that yeah. doesn't make sense, but I'm going to drive to the yeah. free throw line and I'm going to dish to the corner. Okay, okay. And it's like, what? Like, I yeah. still can reverse pivot and, like, I'll spin on you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, and it, it's kind of like I, I grew up playing sports. I've played sports my whole life. I'm always like, why do you think I wouldn't be pretty good at stuff? Like, yeah. you know, like all I guess my, it's, uh, they just look at you and they that's feel like it. you're yeah. the muscle guy. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's like I only kind of recently went down this track. Yeah. So I spent a lot of time doing, you know, other other sports, baseball, football, got into mixed martial arts and Oh cool. Um but I basketball was my first sport. I just kind of didn't grow. <laughs> yeah. That that hurts that could hurt your career. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't yeah, it was like I was real good up until 12. Okay. And then it just, you know, I did, I basically just stopped growing height wise yeah. at 12. And it was like, yeah, this is getting real tough now. Yeah, know? exactly. <laughs> exactly. So from a programming standpoint, how does a strength program differ from if you're going for straight aesthetics? Yeah. I mean, uh, they're very closely related in some ways. Okay. But, uh, strength there's there's like it, it's muscle tissue and your nervous system that really drive the strength uh system really the right. expression and um you know tissue is just you know just literally growing uh it doesn't all it, the it's tough because like the best predictor of how strong someone is going to be in a movement is the cross-sectional area of muscle they have in the tissues that drive a movement. Right. So like, you know, you can predict how strong someone's bench press is by how thick their pectoral muscles are. Um, okay. But sometimes those like big strong guys aren't functionally strong in sports, right? Like you kind of push them around yeah. and then you see like the skinny guy who's kind of wiry and you can't push them around as easily. Yeah. You know, and like these are the kinds of questions that have driven me crazy over here <laughs> and have made me build models to try to explain these things. Can you at this point? I think I can. Yeah. yeah. Like, um, you know, there was a. This is where I get like sciencey and nerdy. Good, good, good. Thing. We like, like that. Yeah. You know, there was a paper written in 2017 by a researcher, Glazier. Okay. And um, the title of it was "Moving Towards a Grand Unified Theory of Sports Science." Okay. Ex either sports science or exercise science. I, I can't remember now. Okay. But um, for somebody to publish a paper like that in academia, that's a very ballsy title. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. Hey, this is the grand unifying theory of the whole thing. This is it. It's this done. is it. Yeah. <laughs> and. Um, so it's a really difficult paper to read, but it's yeah. in the in the 
in the sports science industry, it's kind of referred to as the constraints paper. So constraints are just bumpers or barriers or boundaries or, you know, endpoint markers of things. Um, yeah. But the idea of it is that it constraints are always what create directions and shapes for everything in the world. Okay. And, um, you know, he broke it down to there being three subtypes of constraints to work with that you have individual constraints, uh, task constraints and environmental constraints. So individual constraints, like we have very different body types. You, you know think? what I mean? Like you have very long limbs. You've got longer tendons that make up like the proportion of muscle to tendon for things. Um, you know, I've got a big torso, but I've got short limbs. So our individual constraints for the way that we move and the way that we'll express movement are going to be different. And, um, you know, that's, that's true of everybody, you know, like there's slightly different, like, uh, parts of your shape. Shapes drive stylistic points of movement, you know, okay. like a ball rolls, a block slides, a top spins, right? you know, so people that have certain shapes, you know, like if you look in baseball, Cecil Fielder, Prince Fielder, they've got a distinct shape. Those dudes, yeah. you know what I mean? They're not going to run that fast, but boy, they turn their hips and they're going to drive a ball really far. Yeah. Versus, you know, a guy like LeBron James with his shape, he's going to be like a Super Bowl, you know? Yeah, like, yeah. And so it, it's across the board. If you look at the podiums at the Olympics for the different sports, you're going to yeah, notice so like, different. okay, these people are sort of shaped like this and those people are sort of shaped like that. And there's some science that actually kind of goes into that as well. But, um, you know, there's, there's certain things that pop. If you just look at the individual constraints of someone's body and skeleton shape and tendon length and muscle shape and things like that, bodybuilding is a classic example of like you want short tendons round muscles and the right ratios of limbs to body sorts of things you and know? naturally you, ha you had that like phil heath for instance is like the perfect representation of what you want you know he's like, like the michael jordan of kind of i mean ronnie well, coleman as well yeah like ronnie well Coleman's arnold probably the best but like arnold's up there too right uh, yeah, different eras. Yeah, different, yeah, they're, they're looking for different things in different eras. Right, but right, like right. Phil Heath's muscle shapes, he's just got the roundest muscles ever. So it just looks crazy. You know, it's like nobody else looked like that. And um, his tendons aren't very long. You know, like his muscle occupies like the whole space between the two bones. Yeah. Um, which is probably not the best thing for basketball. Right, you know? right, 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 right. But it's perfect for bodybuilding. Right. Um. Anyways, there's there's that, and then there's task constraints. So t let's say I give you a squat as an example, and I change the task constraints. And one, I'll say, I want you to do as many squats as you can in five seconds. And then the other one, I say, I want you to do as many squats as you can in five hours. You're going to approach that very differently. Like the way that you move will be very, very different from those perspectives. Yeah. Um, and then environmental constraints is – to me, the really big one. Like as a really easy, for instance, you could have the 100 meter dash, okay? Um, one, we're gonna let you run on a brand new Mondo surface track, state of the art. You get to wear track spikes, the whole thing, okay? okay. You get starting blocks. In the other one, you gotta do it in a swamp, okay? okay? You're gonna see that very different people are probably good in the different environmental characteristics. Yeah. So as I change, and morph the constraints of the environment, a different kind of person is going to emerge as like the peak perfect representation of what's going to be good at that. Yeah. As I change the task constraints, a different person is going to emerge. If I was somehow to be able to rearrange the individual constraints of your body, you'd be able to be good at different things all of a sudden, you know? So, the interesting thing to me was that this paper was just, it was so theoretical. But it made so much sense to me. It was like, of course this makes sense. Like, we've been hunting to try to explain who the perfect athlete is for so long. You know, like, the Olympics has tried to create the decathlon to do yeah. that. 
They built CrossFit to try to do this. People debate about different eras of athletes and, you know, oh, well, you can't compare Jesse Owens to Noah Lyles because they're running, you know, Jesse Owens is running, running on a cinder track and he had to literally dig holes in it to put his feet in his starting blocks, you know. I mean, Jim Thorpe had to, like, find some shoes before the event, you know. Literally. Like, yeah, yeah. Literally, so. this is sort of like, so... To me, I looked at it like, well, what do I do with this information? You know, what do I act? And, and so I primarily zoned in on environmental constraints. I felt like that, I felt like everybody focuses on the person. And I wanted to zoom out from the person and focus on everything surrounding the person in training and in sports. Right. And so the when I zoomed out and I kind of looked at it from that perspective, what I noticed is that it's how much the body is interacting with external stuff in the sport and what that stuff was like. Yeah. Okay. Determine the kind of athlete that expresses best fit for that kind of a thing. And so I use the term ground to describe the external stuff that you interact with. Okay. So it's stuff that you can touch, push against use to leverage off of yeah. and ultimately figure out where you are in space relative to um, that determines how much ground is in it. I, I try to divide it into two things, external support and neurological feedback. So like okay. people might be like, well, what the hell does neurological feedback mean? We're in New York City. It's very easy to understand. You know that someone's a tourist as soon as you see them walk on the train because they don't grab the subway pole. You know, they don't, they don't realize. And then that train lurches and they get rocked all over the place. Yeah, Versus yeah. if you put one finger on the subway pole, you, you know where you are in space and you can deal with it a lot. Right, better. right, right. So literally just by touching stuff. How much is that? How much of that is proprioception? It's all proprioception, but your proprioception is based on how much your brain can organize to what's surrounding it. It needs to create maps. Wow. And those maps are based on what you touch, see, hear, feel. And I just tried to go with what you can touch as the great limiting factor. And if you, some sports, you touch more stuff and it lets you know where you are in space more. Yeah. Like if you wrestle, you know where you are relative to like, you know, pulling on the other athlete's head or grabbing the wrist or, you know, having an ankle and a wrist at the same time, like, you know where you are because of what you're touching, giving you reference for spatial uh, concepts. Yeah. Even in basketball, you know, you know where you are in the post based on the pressure that the defender is giving you. And sometimes they pull the chair out from under Right, you. right. And so it's, it's relative to these things, you know. And mm -hmm. then external support is... You know, just objects you can push off of and leverage off of. And you don't understand how much of that is a factor until you try to play something like interior line in football or like wrestle or fight in, in combats or even hockey or something like that. Like there's a ton of pushing and shoving off of objects. Um, but ultimately what I did was I created this ground spectrum for sports. And sports that are super high ground and sports that are super low. Explain ground. high okay. ground and low ground. So a low ground sport, the ultimate low ground sports are diving in the Olympics, um, half pipe skateboarding, okay. half pipe snowboarding, surfing. Those okay. are like pure low ground sports, pure high ground sports. Power lifting is probably the most high ground sport there is, but then like interior line play in football, uh, heavyweight wrestling those those kinds of things are are peak high ground sports um and then there's characteristics that make you great on the poles okay so what makes you great in low ground sports is your ability to turn and tumble in space yeah okay i don't know if you've ever watched skateboarding when the you know yeah. on tv when it comes on I have no idea what those announcers are saying. You know, it's like, oh, he did a McDuffie twist, 1080, <laughs> kick flips, goofy flips, yeah, yeah, switch yeah, yeah. back. And I'm like, I don't know what it was, but I know that that dude went up in the air and spun around more times. It's than crazy. Gold medal, yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Same thing with diving. They do an extra twist. Simone Biles wins because she does an extra twist or flip or yeah. whatever, you know. Um, so they have that ability. They they turn and tumble in space better than anybody else. And then on the other end of the spectrum, 
these athletes have the ability to avoid being turned or being tumbled by external forces. Okay. So if you're under a 800 pound barbell, the last thing you want is for that thing to tumble you or turn you. You're done. If you're playing offensive line in the NFL, the last thing you want is to get turned or tumbled. You just, you know, your $40 million investment behind you just got, you know, knocked out for the season. Same thing in wrestling. Somebody turns you, you're on your back. Yeah. Um, so, you know, what helps you not get turned or tumbled is being bigger and stronger, having more mass, particularly more muscle mass. That's what you need to be great at high ground sports. For low ground sports, you have to be like a master of motor control. You have to be able to just have complete control over every part of your body. Mm -hmm. And that's a harder thing to measure. Right. You know, uh, everything else is somewhere in between. You know, I'd love to be able to make this huge, you know, explanation. Basketball is a 47 out of 100 on the ground spectrum. I have right. no idea. Soccer is a 51. Lacrosse is a 65. But they fall somewhere in there. Yeah. Somewhere in there. Yeah. And each athlete probably represents it slightly differently. You know, like a you know, uh, under the boards, power forward is probably higher ground than right. a perimeter player. Right, right. And, uh, you know, you sort of see just, I, to me, it's kind of like understanding that concept is the ultimate tool to be able to tell you how to train someone. Yeah. Know? Because I grade exercises on a list of ground. Okay. Okay. So if we take a squat as a motor program a concept a task i can change that 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 task with environmental changes i can have a very high ground squat or i can have a very low ground squat okay like a very high ground squ squat is one that's very supported and has a lot of neurological feedback so at the top of that list would be like a hack squat even a leg press um you know a pendulum squat is another new machine that kind of exists there's it, generally, it's a machine that's on a track that is very controlled. It's very supported. Right, you know? And right. you're holding on. You're touching it. It's got a backrest, a head pad, shoulder pads, handles, a foot platform. You're, like, totally locked into this thing. Yeah. You cannot do it wrong, basically. Yeah. On the total other end of the spectrum would be some kind of, you know, hey, this person's doing a, a single leg squat on a BOSU ball sort of a thing and that just like, sounds funny it does but it's like <laughs> you know to me it's always like why would some of these exercises exist it's not going to grow muscle tissue it's not going to drive that was like a trend right like balancing on bosu balls and i think it's a bad choice regardless even in the ground concept like i i have low ground exercises that like aren't that but they're based on really being able to understand and control your body in space yeah. and, and level change up and down, yeah. which I think is an important concept. Right. Ultimately, I just have like an exercise for all the major training tools that you'd have. One, you know, a very high ground, high ground, moderate ground, low ground, very low ground. I have those choices in my playbook. And then I take the athlete and I ultimately say, well, I want to match their ground of sport level with the majority of the training that I give them for the exercises that I choose. And I try to do something like, cause it takes my bias out of it. You know, like I'm historically a high ground athlete, you know, yeah. I historically, emotionally, like I would look at some of those things on the low ground and be like, ah, it's silly shit, you know, right. but that's, that's, you know, it's just a bias. It's emotional. You yeah. Know? So if I have something that actually is more of a, I think objective, definition based thing it takes all that out of my hands like i just sort of like match you with what makes sense for the environment of your sport and i f create the right shapes and and sort of like a directional movement is there art to you, it would you say i try to make it as least artful as possible <laughs> scientific you know? yeah 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 um i think that we're do you believe sport is a combination of both I think that science lives under art. Okay. I think that people that are artistic are actually like they're 
if you can figure out what they're getting after and, and define it more accurately, now you have more power over it, more command over it. Like it's, it's because otherwise you're dealing with magic exercises and like things like that. And there's no such thing to me. It's, it's that you, they're, they're getting at a concept that you couldn't quite define before. But as soon as you define it and categorize it, now you can create more options and better choices and fit people into the concept better. Right. So speaking of exercises, what would be eight exercises if you could only do eight for the rest of your life that you would choose? Well, this again, it speaks to the, to the, is this for me, you know, and like for you, for Dr. Pat. So if I'm competing in bodybuilding, well, that would be tough to only do eight, right? Or you think you could pull that off? I think that's probably pretty good for a lot. I think okay. that less choice is often better. You mm, know? Interesting. Like I'm, if a I'm, minimalistic approach. Yeah, man. I think gardening is more of a process of pruning than it is of planting new things. Okay. You know, so that's a bar, Doctor Pat. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, yeah, I'm like, more, I'm more Miyagi like. Okay, I'm okay. I'm gonna trim these bonsai trees. Okay. I'm not just gonna have 8,000 bonsai trees. Okay, right? so what would be that eight? So for me to grow tissue, I want super high ground exercises. So for a squat, I'm probably gonna go with the pendulum squat. Uh, okay. For uh, a hinge, I'm probably gonna go with the 45 degree hip extension bench. Uh, for uh, a Horizontal press. Yeah, I'm a little old school. I still like the barbell bench press. Okay. Uh, for sort of more of a vertical press, I'll, I'll switch it up on this one. I'll go with the Smith Machine incline press. Okay. For a vertical pull, I'm going to go with a uh, the Prime Machine lat pull down. Okay. For a row, I'm going right. to go with the Prime Machine uh horizontal row that they've got too yeah so that's eight right there isn't that's, it? that's is that eight it's probably close to it close to eight yeah but i just think in categories you know what yeah. i mean like uh squat hinge push pull push pull vertical horizontal yeah and it, I'm, I'm checking the big boxes from there for everyday people not competing do you believe like it's more important to lean towards pull exercises when you're going through like the spectrum or the ratios of what you're doing because everybody's in front of them all day on their phone and no not, no. not really i like pull stuff better you're probably better at it yeah <laughs> i like pull-ups i like rows yep. you know yeah so but i just feel like everybody's like in front of them all day now and it's good to balance that out it's, i mean look i just think working out is good yeah you know, training is good like exercise and moving your body is good and like having a goal and moving towards it and trying hard you know you, you, you put those things seem, those things seem to work yeah yeah i mean like i i try to zoom out of the the minutia and focus on the big picture as, as much as i can and like for most people like i think most people probably just need to have a uh, pick a goal you know and move towards that goal consistently and um and yeah, not worry not worry as much about like varying it up like i like the eight exercise thing because it's like well i'm going to be consistent and i'm going to get better at these eight things yeah versus the inconsistency and oh, i'm going to try this new thing a lot of people just spend their time trying new things and figuring out new things and actually yeah. not really getting better at anything yeah for the people that like are obsessive right and i don't know if you go through this but i go through this I'm thinking like to have a good workout program, you got to focus on something. But when you're focused on something, that means you're not focused on something else. That's it. I mean, I don't think there's anything such. uh, Some people might be balanced. I don't know if they're successful. Mm. You know, like I don't think anybody that's normal and balanced is like a high achiever successful in, in, in parts of their life, you know. So, yeah, so is there a program that could get you stronger, get you bigger, get you faster, get you jumping higher, keeping you flexible? Because it's hard to focus on all those things, right? right? Yeah. I think that there is for most people. Okay. And I I, like where you've got to train really hard for really long to start to notice that you're becoming a problem in certain areas. You know, like I've basically created a problem for myself in certain areas. Like I've got – Mount Everest in terms of like strength and force production, but I've got kind of like a Marianas trench for like aerobic performance. Okay. 
And, um, but you know, most people aren't going to go to the lengths and extreme sorts of things that I'm going to go to. Yeah. So yeah. That's, that's really interesting. Like, for man. most people, it's just like, Hey, can I get you to stick to a workout plan? And can we get you to eat like real food and do it pretty normally? Yeah. And if most people do that, they're probably going to get all the things that you're talking about. They're probably yeah. improving their body. Co- body composition lose some fat gain some muscle which all by itself will make you you know stronger and faster and it's, it's so much easier when you're not trying to be elite when you're just, just trying to be pretty good <laughs> you know what i yeah, mean it's it's a uh, it's like a uh, like i said it's a double-edged sword you know, yeah it's like hey you got really good at something but if you get really good at something it means you've neglected other stuff a hundred percent so it's like I, I would like to build some more muscle right but i also would not like to play less basketball right Yep. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so it's I like a lifestyle thing. It's, it's, you'd be able to, you'd have to eat so much food, especially for how long, you, you know, you got a lot of volume of, of humanity to fill in. Yeah. 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 Like, <laughs> I don't have that. You know what I mean? It's, I think it's easier for you if you've just got shorter proportions to fill those things in. You just need less food to fill that stuff in. Yeah. But, you know, you'd, you'd really have to eat on an uncomfortable level to uh to drive that yeah but i i think that like you know you can still do a lot of you know activity basketball that stuff right and grow you just have to literally be in a the calculator would have to be more food in than energy out yeah is there science or is there things that we don't know is a better way to put this about hypertrophy yeah, I mean, I think like we don't really know what, from a scientific level. Do we know what hy- what causes hypertrophy? This is a great question. I only ask the great questions, Doctor Pat. And I would say that we we <laughs> do not currently have a great model of everything that drives hypertrophy. How is that crazy when all of your goals are building muscle right now? So, like as a for instance, you know, we just came out of something called the hormone hypothesis okay for driving muscle growth okay like when i was a student uh, master's program phd program i i got my phd in 2009 everything was hormone hypothesis based so we were looking for workouts that would spike testosterone levels spike growth hormone levels and if you could figure out what protocols did that that was good because those hormones would help promote muscle growth what somebody figured out was that actually wasn't the case. Like when we started to see the workouts that spiked those hormones, they only spiked for a tiny amount of time. Okay. So they would need to, like the reason steroids work is because you've got elevated testosterone levels and things like testosterone for huge chunks of time. When you do a workout that spikes those things, it spikes for 45 minutes and then it's back down to, to normal levels. 45 minutes of spike is not enough time to do anything. It's like if it rains for five seconds in the desert, it's not enough to change it from being a desert. It would have to rain all the time. Right, right, right. So it was quickly realized, like, actually, the things that make hormones rise are just threatening, stressful situations. Okay. Like the kind of workouts that do that would be like uh, three sets of squats at, you know, to 10 rep max with 60 seconds rest between those sets. Okay. Like that's horrible. That's about as bad as it gets. Okay. You know, like you're going to puke from that. You're going to be. And that's you know, conducive to hypertrophy to building muscle. It's conducive to spiking hormones, which they used to think mm. would grow muscle tissue. But then someone realized for looking at a graph over time doesn't do anything. So that was the dominant theory for how to train for growth for a long time. And like I said, we're just coming out of that. You know, what we- Where are we now? Where are we now? Is where it- we are at now is the mechanical tension concept. Okay, it's, tell me it's, about that. So mechanical tension is like, uh, how much tension do your muscles have to create to deal with forces? And um, so it's, uh, 
What that really kind of equals is that there seems to be a threshold of tension that you have to create. And like some people mean think that like uh, kettlebells is actually a good one because there's a lot of like tensioning techniques. I am the kettlebell guy, so yeah, so talk to me. So yeah, like you, a lot of times it's like we're going to breathe like this and we're going to squeeze really hard and that's going to create tension. But that's not what this is really based on. This okay. basically says that as the weight that you're lifting increases, tension increases. Okay. Like it's just, just what it is. So it's more about the, the weight, the load that you're using. It could, or in like an isometric, you could be creating tension with no weight, right? That's sort of the thing that we're not referring to. Okay. Okay. It's kind of just squeezing. Stuff. Got you. Got like you. Got you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm creating. So tension. basically creating tension with resistance. Yeah. It's like unconscious tension creation. Like okay. you're just, you have to because the weight is making you do that. So in layman's terms, what are, what are we thinking now? So <laughs> it's, it's, that'll cause yeah, somebody to get more that's muscle. That's a great question. Like, yeah. That's where it actually becomes a little bit harder to explain, mm. to tell you the truth. Like, I'd love to just be like, oh, it means this simple thing. But we're – so where we're at right now is they think that there's a threshold that you have to get over for tension in order for the weight to be enough to grow muscle. So – it, it, it's not that as high as you think, you know what I mean? Okay. Like, it seems as though anything up to 30 reps has the same growth promoting potential. Okay. All right. It can't be uh, so light that you can do 50 of it. Right, right. But it has to be 30. And then like, you probably shouldn't go below five. It's five is more the strength. It is. You'd have to do a lot of sets of five and that probably would just beat up your joints. Okay. You know, like that's sort of what we've seen. Like everything from five to 30 is potentially equally growth promote, promoting, but there's like some pros and cons to five range. You know, I mean, you know, Pavel, he talks about like doing five and taking a long break or not doing yeah. anything for a while, then going back to five. That's like a strength protocol, yep. right? I think that, uh, I think that rest periods, we were taking really way too short rest periods for promoting growth. Again, because people were in this hormone mm. hypothesis. To, kind process. of to the kettlebell thing. Like when I'm doing kettlebells, there's basically no rest a lot. Like it's like, you know, sometimes you do the 40, yeah. 20 interval stuff, you yeah. know, which is really fun. Like you feel like you're getting a great workout. Mm -hmm. But from what you're saying, it's probably not the best for hypertrophy. It might not be heavy enough. If you can do it under those. Yeah. In, in that context. It might yeah. Not right, be right, 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 right. Uh, yeah. Because you probably, if you had to, you could probably do more than 30 reps. Right, right. You know, this is like holding a gun to your head. You yeah. can't do more than 30. Right. Sort of a thing. Um, but it's, it's like, it has to be heavy enough. And then one of the critical ingredients is you basically have to go right up to where you're going to fail. And if you don't go right up to where you're going to fail, it's not enough inside that set to promote growth. Yeah. Okay. So do, do you, do you stay at home thinking about like, like, you know, Einstein, I, I recently read his yeah. autobiography. Like he just did a lot of, obviously he took a lot of time just thinking. So are you just like home, like thinking about like, I wish I know what exactly causes hypertrophy because it would give me a huge advantage over the competition yeah, when it comes to stuff all the time. You know, yeah. when it comes to bodybuilding. Yeah. I mean, yeah. like if you knew that and nobody else knew it, you would have a tremendous advantage, right? I think I do have a tremendous advantage because I think I'm about as close as you can get okay. to understanding this I like stuff. that. I like that. And so I know that like I got to pick a weight that's heavy enough for me to you know do it between five and 30 uh, and I need to do the set basically right up until like I'm going to fail you know okay and it's got to be pretty close you don't have to absolutely fail but you got to get pretty close to and fail. there has to be a large volume of that over the course of time right it has to progress over time okay in terms so of weight that you're lifting Something has to That sounds progress. like strength. Something yeah. has to progress. Okay, okay. You know, it, it whatever worked today will not work in the future. So I think- That's in know, life, right? What takes you to A to B won't take you from B to C, right? The other thing yeah. is we kind of started talking about like substance abuse in the beginning. And it's not that different from what makes things grow because you will build a tolerance to a, 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 a like a stressor. Okay. So, hey, maybe, you know, three beers got you drunk uh, freshman year of high school, but that's not going to do anything to you like 25 years old with steady, steady training. Yeah. Okay? yeah so yeah. it's an exposure thing. It's not, it's kind of like uh, sun tanning too, you know, like, yeah. uh, you know, hey, 10 minutes out in the sun for a super pale person in Miami might burn you. Uh, but if you're, you know, exposing yourself to that repeatedly, now it's going to take 30 minutes. Now it's going to take 40 minutes. So 
it, there's going to have to be an increase in this stuff over time. So it's it's also kind of like, well, this this gets to the question. It, it needs to be heavy enough. You need to push yourself close enough to failure in the work bouts that you're doing. And then how many times do you have to do these things? And for like kind of trained people, it seems that somewhere between eight sets for that muscle up to maybe 24 sets for that muscle per week is the amount of times you have to do it in order to, to stimulate it to respond. Yeah. Um, and maybe in week one of a training program, it's eight times. And in week 15 of that training program, it's 18 times. Okay. So that's what I mean by it's got to progress across time. Yeah. Um, and probably over time, you're going to have to add load to this situation. Um, you know, but the, the thing that I find very interesting that's the newest research coming out is it seems as though the stretch position for the muscle and loading it there is really important for promoting growth. Range of motion? Yeah, but not the top necessarily, the bottom. So, yeah, wherever yeah. you create the biggest stretch seems to be super important. It, that's a big difference from what we used to think, right? When, like, you know, you shouldn't bring your knees over your toes. Yeah, and, that's out. You know, like, that's yeah. the, how you stretch your quads. Right, right, you know? right, right, right. Uh, like, <laughs> yeah. you, you got to – And but it also kind of explains, like, for most exercises, why people don't get results. Look at how people lift in the gym. They do the top part of the bench press. They load this it up This is too the much. problem in the gym. Well, that's a huge problem. It's but a even really when big people problem. Are in action, <laughs> you know, they squat and they do tiny reps. They're not. Getting, yeah. They're not bringing their butt down to their heels. Yeah. You know, they're not stretching their quads. They're not stretching their glutes. Yeah. Uh, they're not stretching their back on rows. Yeah. You know, so it's got to stretch you. Okay. But then it's the weird part about this. This is where I think it gets interesting. This is where people are like, wait, what? Like. It's got to be the most challenging in the stretch. So what I mean by that is at different points of an exercise is where the exercise is most challenging. So if you think about like a dumbbell lateral raise, for instance. Okay. The hardest part of that is when your arm is out by your side here. Yeah. Okay. The reason for that is that every movement that you do involves your body rotating. And the, the parts of your body move through an arc of motion. Yeah. And part of that arc is really close to your midline. And part of that arc is really far away from your midline. Right. So the farther horizontally that the weight is away from you, the more challenging it is. Right. Okay. So some instances that causes a stretch. And in other instances, it causes a shortening. So like a dumbbell lateral raise, the deltoid shortens as you're getting into the hardest part. That's not ideal for promoting growth, it seems. Instead, what you want is for the muscle to be getting stretched as the weight is furthest away horizontally. So if I give you the like a th – this was a very interesting study that kind of started this whole thing. They compared a preacher curl to uh, an incline bench curl. You know, incline bench curl, you kind of lean back, yep. the weight's down by your side at the bottom, and the bottom is where the bicep is getting stretched. Right here in the, in the incline bench curl, the weight is horizontally, the weight is horizontally right under your elbow. So there's no horizontal distance. Right. So it's not challenging there. Okay. okay? The preacher curl, as you lower it, the weight moves horizontally away from the elbow. Right. So as the bicep gets stretched, the weight is moving away, which makes it more challenging. When they did this study, they saw that the preacher curl grew the biceps way better than the incline uh, bench curl. So both of them featured a stretch, but one of them featured stretch with increased challenge. The other one featured stress with stretch with decreased challenge. So. It seems as though if you choose exercises that involve stretch with increased challenge, that is the mechanical recipe that you really want to package together to so, grow. So tissues. the most resistance when it's when the weight is furthest away from your body. Yeah, just think horizontal. 
Okay. That's I mean, almost the opposite of what a band does. It's the exact opposite of what a band does. <laughs> yeah. That's why I would never use a band if I wanted to grow muscle tissue. I always thought bands were overrated. It's a, it is the exact reverse profile of yeah. what you want to do to grow muscle tissue. So, so I'm trying to think, like, how could you create the opposite of that? Well, there that you're going to see machines, machines change in the next five years because of this research. Okay. Now, and there's going to be new machines of, with people trying to find a competitive advantage, right? A hundred percent. I mentioned Prime when I was talking about the lat pull down the horizontal row because they're the ones. Maybe you've seen them. They have like three different pegs where you can put uh, plates. Okay. Okay, okay. Okay. One of those pegs moves horizontally further away as you stretch the tissue. Okay. One of them stays the same, and one of them moves closer as you stretch the tissue. I mean, I would always choose the one that moves further away as you stretch the tissue. Yeah, yeah. But they're the first machine maker. To and you've been using it? Yeah, they're great machines. Okay. You know, like, I, I mean, look, like, I want to be as good. This is year two for me in bodybuilding. I want to be as good in bodybuilding as I possibly can be. By year five, I want to be a pro and I want to be pretty good in a pro division. You okay, know? okay. So I'm invested in this. You yeah. Know? Like, it's like a car guy where they're like talking about engines, you get lost, but they're like, yeah, dude, this is like, you need this thing. Like, so to me, like, if you're talking weights and you're talking growing tissues, this thing right here is like what I think, and it's all based on tension. Yeah. Okay. So when you stretch a muscle, it gets uncomfortable and it starts to stretch. That's tension. Okay. So you're adding the tension res like from the the resistance with the tension from the inside being you're just you're you're summing tension together yeah passive tension with active tension yeah it's just more tension i think that's all that explains it but um you know i i've grown a preposterous amount of muscle i could tell recently too <laughs> like during the gaining phase i gained 22 pounds of mat of muscle tissue across 21 weeks uh with dexa and and look i'm not gonna uh, like i take performance enhancing drugs like yeah. i'm a competitive bodybuilding right but compared to other people taking peds and doing bodybuilding 22 pounds of muscle tissue in 21 weeks is preposterous. Yeah. You know, and I do think it's the result of putting all of these methods together. You yeah. Know? Like the food, the appropriate weight, the appropriate uh, effort inside of the set, the appropriate mechanical matching of stretch plus increased weight challenge at stretch over and over and over and over again. It, it's just like rolling a snowball. It's just using more sticky snow to make a bigger snowball faster. Yeah. What have you learned over, you know, to start to wrap up now, what have you yep. learned over the time during your newfound bodybuilding journey? Like, did, has it helped you at work and training others and working with others? No. <laughs> no. And is your, is your, you know what? I, I can speak to myself. Like, yeah. I'm way more passionate about training myself than yeah. anybody else. Are you the same, same. way? 100% the same. And, and I love that you admit that yeah. when you're probably working with others, right? right? Yeah. I'm like, it's kind of boring, man. You're not. Like, like, when I'm helping somebody else, I actually want to be involved in the workout. Yeah. Me personally. Yep. <laughs> I'm like, this is, it's, it's kind of like, I, I, I want to, I like, It'd be like, I like driving Formula One cars and I'm just watching like, uh, you know, people drive Toyota Corollas. Okay. Okay. It's like, oh God, come on. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Yeah. <laughs> like, and even with like uh, high level athletes in other sports, like their training is not, they're a lot of times they're like training a personal training client in yeah. all honesty. You know, it's yeah. like they got to work on the same stuff as regular people. Hey man, did you go to bed on time? Did you eat all your meals? It's the same stuff. It's yeah. like. You know, and they don't want to try that hard and with weights or conditioning or any of the other stuff. It's very rare when you get like a Jerry Rice, you know, that's like an absolute animal and measures everything he eats and like trains hills just because he likes. I love to. hill sprints, by the way. I just want to let you know it's one of my favorite things They're to do. Phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. But yeah. how many? It's just it's yeah, just yeah, so yeah. rare that you get like that that Kobe Bryant that's like, yeah. hey man, tell me everything I need to do to the highest degree possible. And you're like, hey dude, like hey, maybe you shouldn't go and shoot around at 3 a.m. Like maybe go to sleep, you know, like it's probably a good idea. Um, those are to me like that's kind of how I am. You know, it's like I 
I'm going to do, I'm going to become completely obsessed with something. Other parts of my life are going to fall apart. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's just like, I'm okay with that. You know, it's like, I've been doing that for so long that it's like, I know that that's who I am. I don't expect myself to change at any point, but yeah. It, me being obsessed with a new part of life or a new thing doesn't help me in other parts of my life okay. whatsoever. Okay. Okay. All right. Last thing before we get out of here, what is one piece of advice you would give your 18 year old self knowing what you know now? <laughs> um, hmm. Probably just like, Hey, you're, you're, a little crazy man like you know direct your crazy at more productive things now and you know i might give like a whole sheet of things to direct it towards um it's funny like i i have to say like i don't know if you've had this experience yet but like realizing i'm more like the adults in my family than i would have understood previously you know what i mean okay okay yeah like okay so i went to the first bodybuilding show that i did and I was walking around before I had some time to kill and I, I opened the door and I was like all the, all the bikini competition girls and they're all in like these robes and they're getting their hair done and nails done and stuff like that. And I had the weirdest thought in my head. Like, you know, I, I grew up with an aunt and she like raised dogs and we went to dog shows and stuff like that. Okay. I think and, I seen you post about this. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So like, yeah. With going all these dog shows, you sort of see like, hey, there's these camps of people. You get like the working class dogs over here. You get the toy dogs. You get the hounds, the blah, blah, blah. Okay. I realized I was at a human dog show. Okay. And you were a part of it. And I was a part of it. And because I was always like, I'm nothing like my aunt. You know, she's This like, is what you've been training for. Yeah. Because she's obsessed with dogs, dude. Like you cannot have a conversation with her for more than five minutes before she's showing you pictures of dogs. and talking That got to be about somewhat annoying. It's crazy. You know what I mean? It's, it's crazy. Like, she's like, oh, I'm going to get this dog from Germany, and it's got this bloodline, and, like, if we, you know, have this one and this one from Sweden, like, it's going to be this perfect match. And she, um, and so I'm like, oh, my God, like, you're so obsessive and crazy. And, like, and then I realized, like, oh, man, I'm, I'm equally obsessive and crazy. I'm just in a... I'm just in a human version of the same thing where it's like you have to because in dog show stuff, they're obsessed with what kind of food do you feed them? What kind of like protocols do you have for like, you know, like she'll send dogs to live in a colder climate so that the fur grows to the right length. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll run them at certain speeds like so that they develop their legs appropriately to look right in the show. They're, they think of things that you couldn't ever even begin to imagine are details that like normal people would never think of. You have to be so completely invested in this topic for years. And, um, yeah, it was just like, oh man, I'm just like her just in this other version of it. And so I probably would just tell that 18 year old kid, like not everybody's as obsessive as you are. Okay. Like, but it's who you are. Okay. So just let it bring you wherever it brings you. Because I have found like, you know, if I just sort of jump in that current and let it pull me, I end up in places like this. You know, it's like I end up, I've, I've, you know, flown to Europe and presented in different countries. I've gone to China. I'm going to go to Australia. I'm going to do all these things. I've met all these cool people because I've just followed my passion. And it's been a problem in certain parts of my life. But if I try to be balanced, I just do nothing, you know, and then I'm unhappy. So at the very least, if I'm like in my pocket and my obsession and kind of going where it brings me, it's an interesting life that brings me some happiness and I feel some fulfillment. I totally feel the same way you feel about my own life. Yeah. Kind of, besides the dog show part, but everything else after that. <laughs> you never know what that's going to be, though. You know? It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. My dog show is obviously the podcast and basketball. Yeah. And yeah, and I mean, even things like this are special for me because I'm tremendously, I tremendously respect everything that you do. And it's great to have you here, man. I really I appreciate see you. I break down basketball stuff sometimes. Yeah. And like, I'm like, how are you seeing this? Or what are you talking about? Like, with uh, with Chet, for instance, mm. I didn't know who the hell this guy was, and I looked at him I'm like, "There's no way this guy's gonna be good." But you kept talking about he's got the tools, he's got the stuff, and then I'm watching him play, and I'm like, "He's right." 
Like this, this. How does he write about this? Yeah, it's kind of like um, how you fit. The NBA is like its own sport, and I kind of like look at what that guy could do and how it's going to fit in that specific sport. It's almost even like something different than basketball. It's like a very. It's almost like a niche sport at this yeah. point, and I can kind of. I've got to a point now, like not to toot my own horn, where I feel like I could figure this out way quicker than somebody else who might be studying that player for a long time. Like, oh, that skill set fits with this sport, you know? Yeah. And that's kind of how I go about things. Right. You know? I mean, that to me is like, I hear that and I'm like, oh, that's exactly my life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because I can, I immediately kind of like, I see less information, but I know what to do with it much faster. I know. What I guess fits. that's like, you know, Robert Greene has wrote books about this mastery, right? Mm -hmm. Like you've had, we've probably both had way more than our 10,000 hours at this point, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly <laughs> it. You know? I mean, that's what it is. Yeah. Dr. Pat, thanks so much for taking the time. You're always welcome back on the show. We got to do this again soon, man. I'd be thrilled to. <laughs>